Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Dean, and I'm a writer and also an instructor at Selkirk College. I'm really happy to be here this evening. Um, I'm one of the members of the organizing committee for the Artist Reading Series, um, and I'm coming to you tonight from uh, Crestover, BC, which is on the traditional lands of the Sinaiaks people. So I just wanted to extend my own personal gratitude um, for the local Sinaiaks who do so much in the region to educate us settlers. This year, the Oxygen Reading Series Committee made a decision to include one or two creative writing students in the readings. Um, so obviously, as an instructor, I'm very excited about this because they're my students and they're amazing. Um, so tonight we have we have two students who will be joining us, um, Andrew Wood and Gwen Higgins. So I'll first introduce you to Gwen Higgins, who is an accountant by day and a writer by night who lives in Castlegar with her husband. She has a uh, husband, two teenagers and a dog, can't forget them. In her spare time, Gwen volunteers with Girl Guides. She's currently a student uh, in the Selkirk College Creative Writing Program, and she's also a participant in Oxygen Arts Mentorship Program with the esteemed Susan Andrew Grace. Gwen likes to read, and she's never far from her Kindle. Thanks so much for being here tonight, Gwen. First, I'd like to give a, a land acknowledgement. I'm calling in from Castlegar on the traditional territory of the Sinaiaks, the Salics, and the Tunaha, and the Shuswap peoples. I'm grateful to be here. So as you know, I'm Gwen Higgins, a student in the Selkirk College Creative Writing Program here in Castlegar. Uh, I'm originally from Kimberley, BC, and I'm grateful to have been raised in the Kootenays. I'd like to thank Lisa, Lisa Dean, my writing teacher, and Susan Andrews Grace, who mentored me for this reading, and Art Oxygen Arts Centre for hosting. It's an honor to be included in this reading night with Alexei Perry Cox and Aisha Sasha John uh, and my classmate Andrew. Really excited and nervous. Tonight I'll be reading two poems from my chapbook, Picking Up Fragments Origin Story and Fragments. Origin Story I come from a teenage mother, a blue collar father a small mining town where they don't know MBA speak. I come from parents who split up on the wrong side of the tracks in a dirty home in the trailer park, and I smelled like cigarettes. I come from love and contradiction, shame and abandonment, the black garbage bag dumped at the foster home. I come from refugees of war-torn Palatine in 1709 harsh cold winters, Mormons, Scots, and New York colonists who stop my self-pity. I come from high school, community college, university with a bachelor's degree, to a corporate job away, far away. I come from my mistakes and failures, my choices and my actions, natural consequences and free will, and learn to take up space. I've come back to put down roots, to raise children, to build a life, to stay and live, to stay alive. Next and last is Fragment. In Hanoi, Vietnam, there is a ceramic wall so long, it holds a Guinness World Record. A tall, muscle-bound, blonde white man is leading my fat tourist body through a jog. He explains the features of the ceramic wall. Nearly four kilometers in length, it flanks a thoroughfare packed with shiny red and blue and silver motor scooters. There are five million motor scooters in Hanoi, the tour guide says, and whizzing cars and bustling peddlers and city pedestrians and walls of noise that hem us in beside the wall. I smell exhaust as I run along the sidewalk following my trainer. It's endless shiny tile mosaic, one vignette after another. Here, a temple shrine with red roof curled up at the corners. Next, a village scene with children playing. Then a series of vignettes rend rendered in pixels of tile. The name of the city, Hanoi, a bamboo forest, koi fish and water lilies in a pond, dancers with fans, celestial objects, ships with oars sailing the waves. 
Be careful not to leave the sidewalk, he says, as we skirt around the slow walking family. Horns honk in agreement, the traffic never ending. At least 10 lanes of chaos right beside us. I'm choking on the fumes. Imagine what it would be like to run beside all that traffic. It is the 23rd month of the pandemic, and instead of exploring the wonders of Asia in person, like I thought I would at my age, I am exploring it through the six inch video screen of my treadmill, watching a recorded workout video, trying to reclaim what was lost from my body during these past two years of isolation, picking up fragments of my former self, what I used to love, used to wish for. None of it seems relevant in the face of the threat of imminent death on contact with other humans or being the cause of death for the frail members of my family. It all seems so selfish now. Who can fly to Asia when there's disease and the earth is dying? I dump out my bucket list and run beside the ceramic wall, looking for fragments of my former self to create a new mosaic. And that's it. Thank you. Ah, Gwen, that was awesome. Um, dump my bucket list and run. I think that's a nice call to action for a lot of people. Um, thank you so much for sharing those amazing poems. Um, next up, we have Andrew Wood. Andrew Wood is a professional snowboarder with photos published in Kootenai Mountain Culture, Coastal Mountain Life, and National Geographic's 100 Slopes of a Lifetime. At Quest University here in Canada, he explored the parallels between physical and social risk, trying to understand why reading poetry in front of a small group of supportive peers felt so similar to jumping off 30 foot cliffs on his snowboard. As a writer, Andrew has published in Coastal Mountain Life, CV Collective, and a mixed medium collaborative arts production, Word Magazine. Andrew is a second year creative writing student at Selkirk College, and he's a recipient as well of the Oxygen Arts Mentorship Program with Susan Andrews Grace um, to work on his first novel, which is called West of Hope. Thanks so much for being here, Andrew. Hi, folks. Um, speaking to you from Roslyn today, and just would like to acknowledge the snacks, and I'm grateful to be a uh, live, play, learn, and uh, fail and thrive here. It's just truly an honor. So I'm very grateful for that. Today I'll be reading to you a piece, a slam poem. The mighty Mac Jack River flows two directions twice a day. It swells with salinity to the tidal timing of the Pacific Ocean and it can teach. Drive north of the North Island boundary, six kilometers before the highway ends, turn west on the gravel roads and weave your tires through potholes, pushing low branches, side with bumpers, side mirrors, and low gears. And if you persist, you might find yourself in the edge of the Mac Jack River, seven or so kilometers from Raft Cove. Now, my first time to Raft Cove was with a mob of friends and chosen family. And while we have roughed it through some times, this was not one of those times. Two friends had recently acquired a dozen horses power between their pair of tin boats. So we had the unique ability to transport goods in the Mac Jack River. So we all pitched in. Generators, lights, surfboards, spear guns. My dad lent us one of his old amplifiers. We packed it up in waterproof blue totes, and when the planner of our trip spoke about it, he was stoked. My dad's contribution was going to elevate our party's party above the bar. But the music never started. And we burnt a lot of things on that trip. And I mean logs fit for houses, fish bones, beer cans, handfuls of sand. One friend brought these bags of powder for children potassium, calcium, lithium chlorides. Put them in the fire, they change the color of the flame, purple, pink, blue, and green. In the end, the amplifier didn't work either, so we burnt it too. I said it was okay. 
I didn't say I didn't want to, but I wish I did. Such is young and human mentality. The irony of it is, is that the amplifier is from the 80s. And so the soldered circuitry and capacitators crackled and popped and changed the color of the flame. Purple, pink, blue, and green. Manufactured chemical entertainment, I guess. That same friend brought bags of powder for adults. Those bags of powder carried currents of death and addiction. The crutch to his fiction broke. Dreams are not fixed. When the demons had gripped him for will, I was wishing. Our friendship was shifting. We both drew lines. Him above the sand, mine in my mind. It was a trigger pull, then it body bagged our youth. Now I've said no to hallucinations before, but this was not one of those times. I closed my eyes and imagined the miles and miles and miles of molecules between my father and I. I saw my life in seven different shades and in the darkness I saw light and in the light of my friend's faces I saw darkness. I realized my religion was tradition so I picked up a universe of sand and threw it in the fire. My friends repeated the motion with laughter but sad was the emotion that I fell into after. When we finally left, there was garbage on the beach. Nobody wanted me to bring the amplifier back. I thought it was art. I thought it represented something else. It's beauty in, in and of itself. The glass panel on the front of the amplifier shattered, leaving shards that were long and sharp and sand that was deep. And when I expressed my concern for a future traveler's free, one friend said, fuck it, and another consoled, that a late spring storm would wash onto the beach and the waves and the rocks and the salt and the surf would take that glass and turn it back into sand. Some other yahoos would throw it in the fire, they console, said the ocean cleanses. I pointed out that none of us had been swimming. I shook my head, it was time to go. The water started flowing upstream again. On the way back to the trucks, I realized those two forces, those pushing and pulling the salt and fresh water would occur with or without witness. It became okay with the natural color of flame. At high tide, the roots of century old centuries drink straight from the swollen river before it drains, revealing a skeletal structure of trees falling from either bank, their branchless tops meeting in the middle like cross fingertips on the chest of Mac Jack River, in the casket Pacific coastline. For my friends and I, I mourned. Thank, thank you, Andrew. That was beautiful. That was like amazing circularity. And I, I happen to know that Andrew just spent like the last couple of weeks memorizing that piece. So congratulations, that was awesome. Um, so our next reader, I just wanna you know, really give a shout out to our two readers who are on the other side of the country and it's really late there. So um, thank you for not being in your pajamas. I mean, I don't think anyone actually cares nowadays if people show up in their pajamas for things or not. Um, but our next reader is Alexa, um, sorry, Alexa Perry Cox. So, sorry, Alexi. Um, Alexi Perry Cox is a writer, teacher, and organizer. She's the author of Night Three, Re Evolution, Finding Places to Make Places, as well as the full length collection under her, Places Forthcoming with Naomi Press. Um, and I think, yeah, you have like your very shiny and very immediate copy tonight. So that's great. You should hold it up later for us to see. Her poetry and criticism has graced the pages of a wide variety of publications, including Journal Safar, Arc Poetry Magazine, Moco Magazine, Carte Blanche, and the Georgia Review. At the core of her makings is the belief that we imagine relationally, sometimes with words and sometimes with grace. Welcome. Uh, yeah, thank you. Whoops, as I drop everything. Um, <laughs> oh, why is that right in front of my face? Uh, I want to, yeah, uh, just take a little moment and thank the, the readers that came before. Uh, Gwen and Andrew, how fabulous. Uh, really, really extraordinary work um, and really getting to just beautiful, beautiful places. 
um, as well as thanking Oxygen and Greta um, and Lisa uh, for making this possible. And to uh, speak to, you know, former and uh, current students, these are how connections are made. Um, and so I'm glad to see so many of you here in these wild environments of the internet. Um, so yeah, thank you uh, so much. Um, you were speaking about uh, the fact that I, you know, should have a shiny new copy of my work. Alas, it's in the mail, apparently. <laughs> I am the the stuff that I'm going to read from tonight is uh, from a work that is forthcoming with Nomi Press, um, and it's you know coming March 22nd, and I'm just eagerly awaiting awaiting it. Um, yeah, before I jump into things, I also want to just, uh, you know, um, because I won't have the opportunity, or I might have the opportunity to say it after, uh, but speak, you know, directly to just how tremendous the work of Aisha is and how fun it is to be, you know, in this conversation uh, here with you all. So on that note, um, I will say I... Um, I don't think I've ever read this, these works aloud before, these this particular pieces. Um, and I think they've been in my head a little bit, uh, thinking about um, Claudia Rankine's uh, The White Card um, and, uh, you know, thinking about things in terms of, of script writing and how we do sort of an actions in our work. So this, so bear with me as I give myself some very stagey directions and do this work. <laughs> It'll, you'll, you'll, you'll see the, you'll see the, uh, <laughs> the nuts and bolts, the rigging. So here we go. Act one or one act. It had taken us out of ourselves, changed. In a foreign language, Saura made sense to us when the speaker asked us to act it out. We could all head to another place just like this one, but slightly different. And so we're making loud decisions as we said it. The banging fist by the Ministry of Education and effectively the chair calling for order the same banging again. The revolution was dislodging stones. Passions were spilling over, blossoming. One word putting an end to the chewing of water downwards. Saura, on it, captivated, we clapped and smoked, spellbound by the, by the new word that belonged to no one, to no one's side. You got up from your seat, stood up, and it was yours for a second, the second you said it. And we, like strikers, were the actors of history who were called to change life with it. The chair was now inviting the last presenter of the panel whose works were familiar to everyone. Weighing it, as it were. What was the time? He held the watch in his palm. It was gold. No, it was nothing. Nothing but sand, non-existence. And there were things that never passed. Things that were eternal, everlasting. He scratched his beard, still protected from the semi-darkness. Smoothed it. So, you are this panel's last presenter. Gesturing with his right hand. Shall we start? Following a tough act. Ce n'est pas facile. His voice, a sudden rise. Now he tries to make a joke, as if it were necessary to bring some sort of merriment to the atmosphere. That's a tough act to follow. I would like to, comment dit on, change the direction, effectively making use of the staged directions. Alors, let, let me remind you, all one has to maintain the seriousness, the circumstances of the material and place, avoiding at the same time the boredom that such materials, such analysis might cause. 
proceeding as traditional narratives do, long winding, weaving into each other as if the same mood had been recurring in different forms and voices from the beginning of civilization. Laughter erupts, interrupts, exhausted, crumpled, reforming sentence. L'imagination prend le pouvoir. Bon, allons-y. Mais ce n'est pas la première fois. That is all I am saying. Remember, it was hung in the square. Art is dead. Ideas are dead. And death is counter-revolutionary. Really, why should one die? Idiots, keep walking, no? Mass exodus. We then descended, hung on to the other, the noise, the laughter, the slogan of the day, rose from the front rows, beamed, split into factions, like pigeons excreting on everything bounced off the screens to the streets, to the square, tying a tie, fixing a cafe, rolling a cigarette. The S rumbled, thundered. The coils of smoke everywhere ascended, infiltrated, the air a thick misty dome, while the chair purple raged as reported in the press, tried to institute fucking silence so his colleagues could speak. One of them had Mao's little red book in his hand, another held Lenin's text. Put an end to civilization. Soon, soon, the flames will materialize the future. And another with Camus earmarked at every act of, of rebellion expresses a nostalgia for innocence and an appeal to the essence of being. And we wanted to live. We wanted to unlearn everything that we had learned, the green or red or blue or black night. While the mezzanine gradually emptied out, everyone descended from the top rows, joined people in the front, coughed, wanted to speak, to piss, the hall soon empty and the square too. The footsteps died out, dust, the smell of cigarettes. Soon, everything in ruins. And so everything is a question of language. So that's that little piece. Um, that is a, um, it's this funny sort of transition that happens in this book that's forthcoming <laughs> where uh, basically things are taken from an auditorium to a moratorium. Um, and to think about what that means, you know, this language of ideas. And then when it comes to a halt and what opportunities you have in the halt um so yeah and that sort of I mean I'm just gonna do a little bit more and it'll lead to the there's this little section that's from the cultural revolution um because we have you know a lunar moon new year coming up <laughs> so that's just in my head uh so I'll just I'll share a few from that that little section um and I should say that uh basically the there's a few quotes from within this work uh, that are like ancient Chinese philosophical slogans that were deployed by Mao in uh, in the 1930s in the Cultural Revolution in a in a way to sort of give legitimacy to it um, <laughs> in interesting ways. Breathe out the old, let in the new. I know I'm going to lose myself. The ants climb our legs and a certain change of light tells us so. The air that would come and go beneath my skirt no longer presses against my pants. In this moment, the countries beyond our country can vanish. It's just the people in me, us, before all thought desire. The people alone are the motive force in the making of world history. 
the beginnings of everything that seemed to be reality, but isn't. Because we're not outside, but inside the globe, that huge globe so stubborn in its sufficiency. And even far from the classroom, nothing's different. There's just the refined and cultured idea of that opaque and transparent globe that is our image of the world, always turning imperfect and constant inside us. We like the maps and the stability of the geography that situates places in our heads. We like using graph paper to plot the latitudes and longitudes, but we can't measure without our own human inferences. I'll read two more. Let a hundred flowers bloom. Whatever one does, the others all follow, watching from the corners of their irises. That's why I'm going to fold the page away from his gaze and draw a true map where he won't find me. Alone at my desk in the middle of the world, I let a hundred thoughts contend. Seek truth from facts. At the center, the landscape appears and disappears. When I take the oars, you want to teach me how to row over the edge. You try to teach me. You take my hands. He's behind and above me. My fingers are lost in the middle of the boat. We try to steer, but go nowhere. He explains the roundness of the earth, the sharpened tip of the compass needle, like a bicycle spoke, always precise, marking contours, lines, limits. The shadow and the truth of our body in this cultural landscape. Appearances and disappearances when we try to comprehend the possible across great distances, long marches, the symmetry, forgetfulness, or incarnation in other beings, animals, plants, a lot of other women. You taught us, me, all this, but I'm not a map. And I hold still, not still, not still to life. I abandon myself and ourselves and dread the nearing of the end by not seeking truth from facts. Well, that was amazing. This is one of those things where I wish that Zoom was like a rock concert where we could just like stamp our feet and yell for an encore. That was really great. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so our last reader of the night, maybe at the end, if we, if we should more. I'm just kidding. Um, I know it's like super late there. Um, so our last reader of the night is Aisha Sasha John. Aisha Sasha John, his medium is energy. A poet and choreographer, Aisha is the author of I Have to Live, finalist for the 2018 Griffin Poetry Prize, Thou, which was a finalist for the 2015 Trillium Book Award, and to stand at the precipice alone and repeat what is whispered. Aisha was writer in residence at the University of Toronto in 2018 and served as guest faculty for the 2019 Writing Studio Residency Program at the BAM Center. Aisha is also the 2019 to 2022 Dance Makers Resident Artist. In 2022, she continues research on the ensemble work Diana Ross Dream. She holds an MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Guelph and a BA in African Studies and Semiotics from the University of Toronto. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Um, I'm still under Alexi's spell. Um, thank you for your practice and your work. Um, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Gwen, for your practice and your work. Um, it's been so nice to sit here and listen. And thank you, Oxygen folks, for having me and for the care and all the labor that goes into um, putting on events like this. Yeah, it's definitely like 10.30 here. 
I'm feeling, I'm feeling the 1030. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to read from, oh, um, I'm here being uh, Toronto, Takaronto, um, the traditional and ancestral lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. I want to acknowledge that I'm here and um, and all the gratitude that I have for getting to be here. Um, I've never loved winter so much. Um, I'm like, I'm having this like really deep appreciation of Toronto in the winter. Okay, so I'm gonna read from my chat book to stand at the precipice alone and repeat what is whispered. I'm reading from the second edition um, which has new material. I'll read some of that. And the other material that was in the first edition is revised. So you should get the second edition, even if you have the first edition. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm feeling a little nervous. Okay. Um, Ended up as a slimy crustacean with eight legs, but started as me, artist teacher, dressed flamboyantly at some place where they didn't expect me, you know, racist. And they kept putting me through security. And then all of a sudden this white man who was going to reprimand these people, a man I insisted train them in anti-discrimination stuff. He takes me to some place that has hotel rooms and a couple was there, a white couple, who had good babysitters that they were endorsing for a reason relevant to me that wasn't about childcare, but proof rather of someone's virtue. Anyway, they were cheating with each other on their partners. And I left the room to find the like police chief or whoever took me there. And I demanded to know why I was taken to the semi hotel. And then I was a man and the white man, he ended up shooting me with something to knock me out so as to take my skin sample in order to frame me and say I had relations with the woman in the affair I had met moments earlier. And the understanding was that interracial relations were illegal. And then, then there were boats, sailboats and people inside them in this basement suite. And I was still on the defense, fleeing, fleeing, blah, blah, blah. At one point I was flying from these heavy, beautiful sage green canopies that were like, fuzzy very long grapes almost and I was like I'm flying and I was swinging actually and this was a great realization in the dream that swinging from trees was is a kind of flight and the war continued and I had like a 360 degree perspective and then a family with school-aged children came down to the battle zone which became a basement again empty and the kids ran around and I was there. I was the crustacean, all knowing and slimy. Maybe somebody tried to pick me up. My slime was my aliveness. Even though I was bone, I was not a relic. And the slime, yes, was basically pussy juice. And upstairs was a gentrified version of how it had been, except now it was an ice cream store filled with black and brown children and some other kind of bougie restaurant, new and filled future to be unpitiable adequate laughter welcome affection spontaneity surprise to be soul uninjured by envy to be on board to to breach the will of what's most destructive in me to be unwretched black and lovely to be loved an angel, important, defended, remembered, protected, unalone. To live in a bright world, to live in a shine, shine world, to share what I've acquired. What I've acquired has to be relayed from infancy, to be recognized as total. In the cafe, I sit at the only table visited by the sun. Cardamom, cinnamon bun, cappuccino, farting. I'm reading Bolano's 2666, past the part I left off five years ago when my dad returns my call with the plan. 
Vancouver Public Libraries, downtown branches, concourse, 3 p.m. I'd last seen him 14 years prior, and then voila, I have to cover my eyes at first. Laughter. Through my cracked cell phone screen, I try to show him a photo I'd found online of a man I believed to be his father, but the website is down. He presents his own unblemished phone and with an index finger not unidentical to mine, swipes through pics of the framed portraits hanging in the house of me as a child. My favorite one is there, blurred. I'm wearing maroon corduroy coveralls. I'm three, a lamb, the outside edges of my brows pointed downwards, eyes shining, stunned. In 2004, when I was last there, this photo framed the kitchen. Now it hangs in his bedroom. He looks at it every day, apparently. I take a single selfie of us. Then we exit the library from opposite doors. Afterwards, I don't buy the panties I pick out from Urban Outfitters because the cashier says their size funny, nor do I bother to regard closely the ones heaped ign ignobly on the department store's fourth floor. The other thing about today was that I've been experiencing almost uninterrupted clitoral arousal and have been since last night. I'm deciding to understand it as the rogue symptom of a UTI. So anyway, at A's apartment later, placing my fingertips where I believe my kidneys to be, I say, I do feel something back here, but it doesn't feel like pain. It feels like knowledge. And then even later, into the note app on my cell phone, what I'm attracted to in angels is freedom, i.e. the strength to recognize and live and speak the truth. But then I thought, what is wildness or what worth is wildness without the structure of loyalty? and that loyalty and measure are virtues best expressed by the passionate, and that an angel might be a being as loyal as they are liberated. To stand at the precipice alone and repeat what is whispered, I am my own meter, me, because I have made myself in my own image mostly, because I have made myself in my own image mostly at the center of my faith is winking. To drink a water and have some kind of evil diminished, to be held against a surface willingly to be fixed to by an impossibility, to be poured into a vessel so as to exceed it as an elevator, alligator, shift stick, nickname, 50 cent, Dr. Spillers, black celebrity culture, videotaped radio shows, cancer men's meanness, the reproach, arguably, five dogs, never listen, tan line titties, large nipples sucked on, a painting of a hot person kissing someone with at very least a good profile. Like the dark orange of my firmness when I'm just entirely loosening, window shaking, cause a person works. From the apartment next door, I can hear the sound of a drill. And the lamb got to school, how? He knew the way. In fact, what Mary's lamb did is be undivided from his or her want entirely. One of the cats finds me curious as I don't barely look nor regard her. I am wild because I am stupid and I am stupid because I am wise. To experience anything freely, to have communion without narcotic, to meet and meet and meet and meet, to be carried into someone else's imagination like that Sunday night when you wanted to drink, didn't, and was sad and lonely.
now, Monday, up early, tired, Justine's advanced contemporary technique class, resplendent, difficult, I'm embarrassed, but whatever, buoyant also, trying, flopping, thinking. Afterwards, under a heavy rain, I walk up Robson to buy the parable of the talents and the Whole Foods heated patio on which I eat Greek yogurt and granola, staring at the column of naked air between two vinyl rain barriers. As I lower into my seat, the white woman reading to my right moves her apparently precious umbrella from its position between us to her other side. I have to think about that, the moving of the umbrella for a minute. So I do, I imagine I am still thinking. I read my adult children of emotionally immature parents book. I'm waiting for the internet cafe I'm familiar with to open. They open at two, I go there, I print there. I print a choreographic proposal, an earlier version of this, whatever this is, and an application for a co-op in New Westminster for my mom. I spend the day hungry or distressed in the summer. <laughs> I spend the day hungry or distressed in the stomach. The whole basic day is like that and I'm tired as if I'm sick. The night before at quarter after 10, I put pants on to visit the brewery kitty corner from the apartment, returning home with a single tall can, an IPA, and drink it dancing later than I should have for the class I woke up tired for and was late to. Saturday, late again, to the salon this time. A child sits where I should be, his or her, his or her hair blown into a soft black halo. Elsa says to come back in an hour. So I perch at the window of Urban Fair before five steaming chicken tenders and an overly sweet and frosty mushroom salad I replaced fries for unwisely. A horse-drawn Christmas carriage carrying a dozen people passes periodically, which I videotape along with the happy blonde dog on the other side of the window as my feet. Warm punch of gratitude for dog owners, blessed loving ones taking care of these creatures and walking them where I might chance to observe one. A happy, healthy fellow, alone but unabandoned, it greeted children easily. And when its owner returned, it greeted him with the peace of assurance. Nice dog, nice enough man, I think. I mean, who knows, he could be a killer, but nice dog anyway, wagging his tail into the window, his happy, stupid tail. I am a dog too sometimes, when it's safe to be. On the beach, perhaps, I am a dog. That was Saturday's festival. On Friday, I got $60 worth of green clothing from Value Village. I have no recollection of Friday. I am sad, alone, bored, and have no friends. Appetite and austerity. Video of a snake skin shedding. 60 minutes, Australia to will what transpires, to select what is allotted, that which with fairness equals justice, a lot of fat at night, cheese. Apparently it's emotionally immature to set traps for people. The cat shat on the bathroom floor. To have the desire to get milk and to go and get actually milk from the store in new balances, running down and then back up six flights with milk. And to finish the Ellen Boss talk about Dharma and the Ascendant and to focus on this question of fountains so as to begin something and also continue so as to have adequate days to amend, ameliorate, improve, polish, better that which I've begun writing that is a piece about fountains so as to complete an assignment, a text, or an exhibition, so as to get money, so as to give it back, that's right, TD visa, so as to negate what was made actual, a meal, a purchase, a cost, an item made mine by my word and will, with the absented head, away days of being here, busy and idle, purpose and loss, tasked and unmoored, and now owled, as an owl, or with them, or one, or as yes, as one, 
hunting in the night and resting too. I had a dream about a group of people and one of them, this man, something happened to him. I remembered it so well this morning, I imagined never being able to forget. So I will, okay, immediately stop at the round the corner grocery store, overpriced, expensive, windowed there, and purchase with a wave of my bank card's chip, milk. Um, this chapbook is so dense, like, uh, there's so much language. <laughs> there's so much, there's so much, there's so many words. Um, yeah, I'm gonna just read you a little bit of the new stuff. I wanted to do that. It's athletic. It's athletic for me to read this. Um, you can hear it, it's like breath, you know? Um, yeah. And it's like, yeah. Oh, thank you, Lisa. And there's a part of me that's like, like, am I still on Zoom? <laughs> like, is it still, is it still happening? <laughs> um, okay, so finally, I'll just read part of this poem. It's super long. Um, and this is, I think this, this, this in its totality, this covers like, I think like Aquarius season to like Leo season last year. When we pray, we ask the divine to show us how to see. Hell, difference, tower, memory and its opposite. What happened today, yesterday, now? Shut, change, missing something to sleep when tired, boredom to experience stillness being the first to arrive in order to get to where you're meant to be. Intimacy with yourself by being alone. I want you to risk loneliness to learn to pray, to risk singularity, destiny. It is written because I like the feeling, nudity of mind, pleasure sourcing, need meeting, essentialism, listening, loop, flow, that the old English for worry is strangle. I've never dreamt of my father. Duct tape, bed sheets, fake blood, flour and milk. Their whole lives beneath my shade. Beauty, anyone in the grips of freedom or pleasure. Black hole swallows sun vid. Three Libras, obey, allure, outcomes. Fresh air, no self. Love is gentle, enough sleep to rest unannoyed, warm hearted, honest, brave, tender, cherishing, good, terrible, blessed assurance. Everyone is responsible for their own self expression, as in it has to be done, and you're the one who has to do it. The truth will let me sleep. Spurt, purge, self transforming mind, sure. My life is mush, Adi Ashanti audiobook, the dearest freshness, 32% tonight, silk sewing, unconditional friendliness, as little as is needed versus as much as is possible, maverick, women in power, actual unknown, squander synonym, relinquish, if iced tea works, Vestibular lilacs, imagining porridge, the mechanism for letting go and not say as rage or self-improvement fantasies, to experience sadness as itself. 4 a.m. arugula, two horns of a black dragon, not knowing is most intimate. Okay, now I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you.
am I supposed to be wrapping this up? I'm just going to wrap this up. <laughs> I'm like, do you have a script? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, before we, before we turn it over to the Q&A um, that Greta and Natasha are taking care of, I just wanted to, you know, um, probably speak for all of us um, as we as we sort of bow down before your greatness and no, I'm, I'm serious um, that was really amazing readings and I think that we've all been changed at least just a little bit by listening to your words so you know thanks for making the time even though it's like 11 o'clock at night now to to be here with all of us Yeah, thank you, Aisha and Alexi and Lisa for emceeing and Andrew and Gwen um, for reading as well. And um, I think that we have, I mean, three, four, five minutes, maybe if we want to do questions and open up some space um, to chat through some of what we just heard. Um, I know that I'm feeling sort of in a trance and I know folks in, in a later time zone are, are probably feeling more in trance even. Um, but if anyone wants to type a question into the chat or use the little hand raise emoji, or if authors, if you have questions for each other, um, totally, un you can unmute yourselves and do that as well. Um, Just crazy props. <laughs> Just love. <laughs> Oh, here's a question. Fan, why don't you unmute yourself? Go ahead. Hi, I'm here with my sister, Lena. Um, I just wanted to ask a question to Alexi. Um, can you say more about now and its importance for your poetics in the piece that you were just reading? Um, I'm, I'm curious about this interpolation of, uh, of some of his phrases, especially the, the letting the flowers bloom phrase. Um, and yeah, just because I've been thinking about cultural revolution language um, a lot myself, so I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that comes from a section in uh, the book where basically it's sort of looking at uh, how Mao was using sort of like re using that those language and those that those slogans um, uh, as a way to sort of um, yeah make make these big you know transformations and ideological shifts in in revolution um, and the book itself is sort of this project of looking at both um, revolution as a site of uh, uh, hope and disenchantment and so it sort of is working with with that so it's sort of that's that's the narrative that's sort of uh, going through that particular section does that answer some if you have more there I can speak to it directly but yeah that's what where that's from yeah <laughs> yeah definitely hope and disenchantment is yeah. very well. <laughs> a lot of disillusionment a lot of sort of thinking about like revolution is a site of, of failure but is one that you keep having to work work towards more on and it's and it being discursive process thanks so much thank you there's a question from cassidy so i'll let you unmute yourself hi um i'm a student of alexi so hello nice to see you uh, and very grateful to be here my question is actually for Aisha. Um, really grateful to have been introduced through this um, reading to your work um, and hopefully gonna look up more stuff later. I just wanna know about your process because uh, like we were taught, you, like you kind of joked about how the, the work is so dense or so so packed tightly with, with thoughts and words and it kind of has this stream of consciousness quality to it. I'm curious about when you write, is it just all in one go? Like, is it, does it follow that sort of um, like its form or do you edit it a lot more? Like, I, I'm just so curious because it's such a, an, an interesting and it reads so interestingly, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks for your question. So there's like two kinds of poems in this text, one, um, like there are a lot of dream narratives, like the first one, um, but all of the narratives are, yeah, they're written in one go and they're definitely revised, but that the rhythm and the song and the musicality is, comes, um, 
is part of its original. That's why I choose it. But the some of what I read, like definitely like the last part, and I read a couple things that were also of this form are composed very differently. So I, I know it's like 2022, but I still have a Tumblr and I use my Tumblr a lot and I use it in a particular way. Um, in the chapbook, all of the ones that I'm talking about are in all caps. So I use my Tumblr as a kind of notebook. Like it's where I just like, called it like nouning in grant applications where I just like name the thing I like point at like reality whether it's a, a like a material object or an intellectual object or a psychic object I just like name these things so I might do two in one day I might do 10 in one day I might not do one for three weeks so I just have this sort of like thing on my tumblr and then I cut and paste it into a poem. And so like that last thing that I wrote, when I say it's like from Aquarius to Leo, it's like all the ones that I did like that. So there's a, because it's happening from such a long period of time, it's like part of its density is like how much like life there is in not a lot of space, if that makes any sense. Um, so yeah, so there's two kind of, quite different compositional sort of strategies yeah it was that it's that last one that you talked about that really like struck me it's so funny that it, it's collected over such a long amount of time because it, it it also yeah it feels so dense but it also it's funny that it comes from like a tumblr because it's like scrolling through like a feed or it's like it's it's what I imagine reading a person's thoughts would really be like it wouldn't be all well thought out sentences it would just be like this thing I see, this thing I see. And so it like reads to me, it's like if you ever look at your own internet search history, you're like, wow, this is like a, a glimpse into the little window in my mind. So yeah, it ends up being a portrait, like a portrait of a time. Of, like it's all really, it's a lot of, I, I think a lot of my work is like portraiture, um, but yeah, definitely those things end up being, yeah, portraits of a time for sure, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your work tonight. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and uh, you managed to make it so funny too, Aisha. Like it's, it's <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, so uh, maybe it is a nice time to wrap up and uh, have some more milk before bed, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Um, I will plug the next event. It is on the 23rd of February at 7 p.m. PST. Um, Fan Wu and Tiziana Lamalia will be reading. Um, in the meantime, a huge thank you uh, to Alexi and Aisha for sharing your work tonight and to Gwen and Andrew as well for reading and Lisa for emceeing and uh, the author reading series committee and Julia and Natasha at Oxygen um, and Megan at Oxygen, everyone for attending as well. Um, have a safe and good night and um, hopefully see everyone at the February event.